today's lesson is one where a number of people who are, are really top-notch seminary professors emailed me after getting the lesson and said, are you really going to teach this in a Sunday school class? Your class never ceases to amaze me. Does everybody leave when you start talking? And I told them, <laughs> not everybody, just a few. And uh, uh, because what we're doing today in class is truly a material and a type of lesson that you would get if you were in a seminary course on the New Testament. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. This is not just um, uh, 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 the walls of Jericho came tumbling down class. This is one that's, that's a very much um, uh, on, on, on a, a... This is... This is um, fasten your seatbelts, okay? <laughs> Because we're going to make it through about an hour and a half lecture in the next 43 minutes. So I'm going to leave out a lot that's in the written lesson. I can't come back next week and teach this. Next week I've got something special planned because we'll have a lot of guests in. Uh, uh, so next week we'll be totally independent from this. You only get one shot at this from me right now. Your handout's a lot more thorough than what I can do. We're dealing with what's called the synoptic phenomenon. The synoptic phenomenon is uh, something that's, that's uh, interesting to me as a lawyer. It's interesting because as a lawyer, <clears throat> I tried to add up in my brain over the last 28 years, over 28 years, how many witnesses have I taken testimony from? How many witnesses have I cross-examined? How many witnesses have I put on in direct examination? And by my count, it's got to be somewhere in excess of 2,500 witnesses. Something in excess of 2,500 witnesses. I've sat and examined them as they've sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help them God. Now, a few of them won't add the God part. And I'm not allowed to make a big deal out of that at court, though there's part of me that wants to. But these witnesses have taken that oath. And I'm reminded of how, how almost it's become old hat to me on how to deal with witnesses who are testifying about something. I mean, this is what I do day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. So recently I was trying a case out in West Texas where our fellow was working on top of a 13-foot load. And our fellow is 6 feet tall, so his head is 19 feet off the ground. And he has no fall protection while he's up there. And something happens. I suspect what happened was a fellow with a forklift that was nearby bumped the truck where he was. But our client comes falling down onto his head and is seen visually bouncing on the ground off of his head from a height of 19 feet onto asphalt. Needless to say, our client's brain damaged. And so our client's not really in a position to, our client had amnesia, didn't remember anything for the next six to seven weeks as he lay in the hospital in and out of, of comas and all other sorts of things. But, but <clears throat> In the process of this, there's only one witness, and that's that forklift driver that may have actually been involved directly in causing this problem. So the forklift driver, immediately after the incident occurs, the forklift driver, uh, 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 again, our fellow's got, got, this is from the CT scan, our fellow's got permanent brain damage. He's not able to recount all of the events to us with any degree of, of of confidence in what he's saying. So what we have is the witness who may have actually been at fault. <clears throat> and what that witness did is he gave a handwritten statement immediately after it happened. It's what I'll call version one. Now you shouldn't have to put versions up there for statements. People ought to be able to tell the same story each time they have to tell it. But this fellow told version one in his written statement. Then about a year or so later, it became apparent that a lawsuit was going to be filed. So this fellow's employer came to him because his employer, I think, was none too happy with version one. So his employer comes to him and says, uh, hey, uh, write out a new version. And a year later, we get version two that's got stuff in it that version one never had. Then ultimately, the lawsuit gets filed. 
And this fellow has to give a deposition. Now a deposition means he's sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. He's got a lawyer there. We've got a lawyer there. Everybody's there except the judge and the jury. And the court reporter types up everything that's said, every question, every answer. And the penalties of perjury attach. You've got to tell the truth because that deposition can be used at court just as if the witness were there live. Well, sure enough, in the deposition, this fellow who gave version one in his first statement right after the accident happened, version two a year later with the owner of the company at his shoulder, gives version three in his deposition, which is entirely different than version one and two. And I found myself in trial getting ready to cross-examine him. So the night before the cross-examination, I'd looked at version 1, I'd looked at version 2, I'd looked at version 3. And I prepared to cross-examine him, figuring he's going to have to live with his sworn testimony, version 3. But I would show the jury that he'd had version 1 and 2. And i got to tell you, version 1, not real believable, but probably the most believable of all of them. Version 2, clearly had his boss at his shoulder. Version 3 outrageously wrong in my opinion outrageously wrong and I was going to show the jury that the version that this fellow is there to testify about is wrong it's clearly wrong he's not being honest so I get him on the stand he takes the oath do you swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God answer I do and I start in I think I'd gone about a minute and a half. And what I'm doing is I'm going at version number three and I'm going to show that he lied under oath with version number three. And I get into it and within a minute and a half, do you know what he does? He totally throws away version number three and he gives this whole brand new version number four. <laughs> now I'm sitting there and I've got a decision to make as the lawyer. And I mean, it's, it's, it's instantaneous. The decision tree just boom, 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 boom. peters out in your brain. Here's the decision. Do I say, hey, don't sit here and give me version 4. You swore under, earth, ver, vo, under oath version 3. Here it is, typed up in a booklet. I got ready to examine you off of this. You better stick with this story or perjury is going to be brought. That's one option. But I don't do that option because over the last 30 years almost, I've got these rules that I've learned. And these rules apply to witnesses day in, day out. They're just rules. And here's one of my rules. You cannot practice vice virtuously. Look at it. You cannot practice vice virtuously. And I mean this rule flashes in my brain. It's like rule, rule, rule. You cannot practice vice virtuously. In other words, lying is a vice. And if he wants to get up there and tell a lie, he's not going to be able to do it virtuously. I'll let him tell whatever pack of versions he wants to tell. And I will show it to be a lie. So if he wants to tell version 4, God bless him, tell version 4. And he does. Version 4 was worse than version 3. Which was worse than version 2. Which was worse than version... I mean, this fella, what's the thing if you're in the hole, at least quit digging with the shovel? Every version he gave was wrong. And he's finally got the most absurd version you've ever heard in your life. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. And I was able to point it. I, I got to tell you, the guy says, uh, uh, I never lifted him up on the, uh, on the forklift. Um, how did he get up on that thing? Well, I drove up with a forklift and I put a pallet up there 13 feet. And then I got out of the forklift and I never saw anything till he fell. So really, never saw anything. Where were you standing? Right next to the forklift. 
Well, how do you think he got up there? He must have climbed up the mast of the forklift, 13 feet. And you never saw that? Never saw it. I said, it doesn't really work because your forklift's butted up to that truck. How does he climb up this way and then turn around to the other side and then climb up and then he gets to the pallet and he's got to turn around again 13 feet off the ground and you don't see anything and all of this happens in 10 seconds. He says, can I go back to version 2? I said, yeah, but version 2 didn't work because of this. He says, how about version 3? No, 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 remember that was bad. How about version 1? This is the only fellow I've ever met in my life who told four different versions and stuck with each one of them at some point during the testimony. But it didn't work, and his testimony was such that it's just a matter of time. We backed up the garbage truck. The jury saw it as garbage. We dumped it all in the garbage truck, and it was gone. And that's the way it worked. Now, the synoptics, when you get down to it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are three different witnesses, three different accounts to historical events. That's what they are. And I read these accounts, and I read them with my rules of court. But I not only read the accounts, for the last 40-plus years of my life, I've read all of these scholars who write on these synoptics. And i got to tell you, just blunt, the synoptics have every degree of reliability as a lawyer I would ever expect from witnesses. They just permeate credibility. And what really doesn't is what a, uh, is what a number of people put out as scholarship. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I apply my rules of court and witnesses that I've developed over 2,500 witnesses almost 30 years. And when I do, the Gospels stand and shine as impeccable testimony. They pass every smell test I've got. What doesn't are what a lot of the scholars have put out who basically don't live in a courtroom. They don't live with witnesses. Their job and their life is not to try and examine witnesses for reliability. Instead, these are guys who work out of the ivory tower. And there is a lot that comes out of that ivory tower that needs some serious washing because it's just not there, in my opinion. So that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about these Gospels. And I want to talk to you, you see, the way that what the, the issue is for the scholars is how do you take the fact that these three Gospels tell so much of the same stories but have these differences. This is what we're calling the synoptic phenomenon. These other cynical scholars might call it the, 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 the synoptic problem. Um, I called it that at the start of this lesson. Weston Fields wrote me an email and said, don't call it that. It's not a problem if you understand what's going on. It's a phenomenon. It's a situation. It's an opportunity. And so I had to change the title of even my own lesson. But as I'm going to describe to you, I want to describe first what the, the issue is, what the phenomenon is. And then we're going to talk about a fair and reasonable construction of how to deal with it. So there are five issues the way I've outlined the material. And different people outline it differently. But here's what's at issue. Again, we're dealing with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, John has play in the synoptic issues because he does sell, tell some of the same stories. But it's not these, these issues aren't really in play right now with John. We're going to set John aside for a little bit. So you've got issue number one. There are three Gospels that have similar material. Three Gospels with similar material. Let me lay out to you exactly what I mean by this. The Matthew, Mark, and Luke have similar content. They also have similar structure. And they have similar language. Now you're thinking, well, of course they do. They're telling the story about Jesus. No, it goes beyond that. If, for example, we look at the content... The shortest gospel is Mark. Mark has 661 verses. Out of those 661 verses, 606 of them are also found in Matthew. All but 55 of Mark's verses are found in some way, shape, form, or fashion in Matthew. If you look at Luke... 
350 of Mark's verses are found in Luke. You with me so far? What, now, now, some of the ones that are found in Luke are also found in Matthew. All three of them have the same stories. When you whittle all of that out, there are only 31 verses in Mark that are not found in either Matthew or Luke. 31 verses unique to Mark. So you've got this similar material and content. Now Matthew and Luke also share some verses that you don't even find in Mark. Matthew and Luke have 250 verses they share in common that aren't found in Mark. This is an appropriate response. What does all of this mean? That's part of the synoptic phenomenon. But it's not just content, it's also structure. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all start out with Jesus in the Galilean ministry, working till he finally gets to Jerusalem at the end, is crucified, resurrected, and appears publicly. And you have that in all three of those Gospels. If you go to the Gospel of John, you'll see Jesus was making annual trips at least to Jerusalem. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially Matthew and Mark, are not concerned about chronology. That's just not in their way of thinking. They're making a flower arrangement. They're not lining up Russian dolls that each tuck comfortably into the next. So the structure is very much the same. The language is very much the same. If you're reading it in the Greek, you'll find verses where they're using the exact same words in the exact same form in the exact same order. Now you may say, what's the big deal? We do that in English, that can happen. It's very different in Greek. In Greek, word order in a sentence is not dictated by syntax in the way ours is. It's not subject, verb, object. You can put the subject at the beginning, you can put it in the middle, you can put it at the end. You can stick the verb anywhere in the sentence you want to. Because it, it's, it's written where all of the words in the Greek language wear a tag around them. That's usually at the end of the word. And the tag says, I'm the subject. Or, I'm the direct object. Or, I'm a genitive of possession. Or, I'm a or genitive, and then you decide if it's of possession. Or, I'm a whatever it may be. They wear these tags, and since they have a label on them telling you what they are, they can stick them anywhere in the sentence they want. It's un. Incredibly, incredibly bizarre to have these identical words in the same order like we've got with the language. Issue number two. Is there some common source that explains these similarities? There's almost got to be something in common. Because you can't come up with this identical structure, identical content, or semi-identical content, and, and, and semi-identical language otherwise. So what's the common source? If you'd asked Augustine back in the 4th century, in the early 5th century, Augustine would have told you, well, Matthew wrote Matthew first, and then Mark wrote Mark, and then Luke wrote Luke, and then John wrote John. And each gospel writer had the earlier gospel and would supplement it and change it the way that they wanted to to add additional information. That was his view and the view of a lot of people until you got into a very scholastic circle starting in the 18th, 19th century, not 18th, the 1800s. And in the 1800s, it became very common vogue to say, you know, ancient Israel was a society where people memorized a lot of things. And so you probably had a lot of these things memorized by different people as they would repeat the stories around the world. And so the gospel writers took these memorized bits and fused them together into a gospel, which explains why sometimes the wording's identical, sometimes it's not, some people memorize things differently, sometimes the memories aren't great, some got the stories right, some got the stories wrong, did Jesus feed 4,000, 5,000, they can't decide, so they throw them both in there, blah, 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 blah. And that's what a lot of scholars thought. If you fast forward to today, scholars have taken, a lot of scholars have taken not only some of that, 
but they've added to it the idea that there must have been some written sources that were behind our Gospels today. But not written sources in the sense that we've talked about in this class. Here's one of the things that they've done. They said, if you take Matthew and you take Luke, take all of the stories that they've got, all of the data that they've got, and subtract out what you also find in Mark, so that you're looking in that 250 verses that Matthew and Luke have, but Mark does not have. You with me? If you do that, you don't really have miracles. You don't really have healings. You don't have exorcisms. You don't have supernatural acts. What Matthew and Luke have in common that's missing in Mark are basically teachings, discourses, sayings of Jesus. So the scholars have said there's got to be some common source for Matthew and Luke even beyond Mark because Matthew and Luke are each drawing from these sayings of Jesus. So scholars have taken a German word, the German word, I can't pronounce German, how do I say this, Hal? Quelle. Did it, was that close? It's close enough. Hal speaks like 30 languages too. He's really helpful to have around. And if I'm not mistaken, you do capitalize nouns in the German. So it's a capital Q. And this Q, if you take, when, when, when my daughter Rachel was at Pepperdine University, which is a great school, and I'm not slamming her Bible professor, should the Bible professor be watching this, though I do disagree with you on this. <laughs> um, when Rachel was taking New Testament, pursuing a religion major. Her textbook and her teacher talked about the Q source. And if you read much in the academic area, in the New Testament survey, in New Testament study areas, in the Gospels and the Synoptics, you will come across the Q source. Here's the idea. There needs to be some written source that Matthew and Luke are drawing from that Mark did not draw from. And so that unknown source must have existed. There must have been some document that's the sayings of Jesus that has been lost in the last 1900 years of history. But it was there for whoever wrote Matthew and whoever wrote Luke and they drew upon the Q source. Now, there are problems with this Q hypothesis to me as a lawyer and honestly to me as a student. Number one, no Q documents ever been found. I'm a little bit suspicious that there's this magical document that's got these profound verses, 250 at least, that was in existence supposedly at the time of the writing of Matthew and Luke and we've got over 5,000 ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, but this one, poof, disappeared with no copy, no fragment, no verse, nothing that clearly indicates this is Q. You don't even have early church fathers saying, oh, we love that document, the sayings of Jesus. In a way that clearly conveys this was a document that could have Filled the role of this cue. I don't see something so important that the church's canonical, accepted, scriptural gospels copy from it and use it, and poof, it disappears. Especially if something like that truly existed, not only would it not disappear, but it wouldn't be anonymous either. I mean, something that important that the gospel writers are going to, I'm telling you, it doesn't pass the lawyer smell test in me. It does not live up to Mark's rules of court. I, I think that's something people in an ivory tower can think of, but I don't think it's something that practically really works out in my opinion. I could be wrong. I have good evangelical friends who believe in it, but I don't. So, here's what today the, the, the version seems to be. Matthew and Luke minus Mark, the sayings of Jesus, came from Q. And as for the similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them, that's where one just copied the others. Which brings up the next issue. 
If the common source that explains the similarities is Q and one copied the others, then issue three is what order were they written in so we can know who copied who? Which was the original? Who had access to it? All scholars do not agree on this. Some, uh, Hal's got some good friends and Hal maybe himself who think Luke may have been written first. I tend to side with folks who think Mark was likely written first. Sorry, Hal. But I'm not dogmatic on it. The reason it seems to point, the most compelling reason to think Mark is written first is just the way things are ordered. Where Matthew or Luke have anything that Mark's got, they will always, Mark's ordering is the ordering they seem to follow. And uh, I've explained that to you. Here's the problem, though. The problem is that doesn't really explain everything. If Mark's written first and others had access to it, that's not a good enough explanation because here's a fourth issue. There is a problem saying that Matthew and Luke used Mark and Q and nothing more. The problem is this. The 15%, those 31 verses... The 15% that's unique to the Gospel of Mark has some very important stuff. And I don't see you getting some Matthew who's so assiduously careful to, careful to word for word follow Mark in places and so careful to follow his structure and supposedly expand on what Mark had to say because Mark's short compared to Matthew. I don't see someone saying that Matthew did that and then just, whoops, left out this 15%. Luke, whoops, left out this 15%. It's not minor stuff Matthew and Luke left out. There are four things that they've totally left out. In Mark 3, where Jesus' family comes to, quote, seize Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus away because, quote, he's out of his mind. That's what his family thought. That's important stuff. Especially to gospel writers later, recognizing that Jesus' family, after the resurrection, believed fully in Jesus as the Son of God and lived their life toward that end for the rest of their days. The change between out of his mind and giving your life out of faith is profound, but it's left out of Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke don't have the parable of the growing seed. Matthew and Luke don't have the healing of a deaf mute in the Decapolis in the ten Greek cities in the east. Matthew and Luke don't have the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. All of this is myth missing. Now here's my rule of court. Oh, there's more too. You can look at areas where for Matthew to have expanded Mark is just wrong and Luke to have expanded Mark because Mark's got some passages where he tells great details that Matthew and Luke leave out. Matthew and Luke condense Mark in places. So here's my rule of court. A good witness is a good witness. You're not going to, I'm not saying people don't make mistakes, but 99.9% .9 of the time if someone's a careful and diligent witness then they're going to be a careful and diligent witness. You don't have someone who's one thing one day or one thing one moment and something entirely different the next. I mean, come on. Matthew and Luke, and Mark, but Matthew and Luke have carefully parsed the Old Testament. Not only taking Old Testament scriptures that most people may have known, but finding obscure passages that speak of Jesus. And they have crafted together, Matthew has crafted together this incredibly articulate gospel built around the five books of the Torah. And it's done, I mean, this guy's brilliant in what he's done. And yet, we're to say he's so bumbling that he made these horrible mistakes. That just doesn't happen in the real world. It just doesn't. Issue number five. If Matthew and Mark are, or Matthew and Mark and Luke are so related, why are there differences between them? Let me give you some examples about this. There are differences in the words. Now here's some scriptures for you. I hope you can follow this. We're going to look at the same story 
in all three of them. Matthew 20, 24 through 28. This is when they're, they're fussing about who's the greatest. Jesus called them to him and said, Matthew says, but Jesus called them to him. Mark says, and Jesus called them to him and said, to them. The red words in the PowerPoint are different words. Now, this shows you some great similarities here, but it also shows you some differences. Let's keep going. Matthew, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Mark says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise great authority over them. That phrase, those who are considered, inserted in Mark, not found in Matthew. It continues, it shall not be so among you, but whomever would be great among you must be your servant. In Mark, same thing except the word but is added. Matthew continues, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Mark, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all instead of your. Okay? Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Mark says, for even the Son of Man. Same thing from there on out. Now watch this. Luke, look at the way Luke relates this story. And he said to them, the kings, instead of rulers of the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and let the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table, but I am among you as the one who serves? Radically different in Luke. Not only that, but if you look at it in terms of how it's set up, in Matthew and Mark, it's set up because... The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and said, Hey, when you come into your kingdom, would you let my son sit right and left hand side? And Matthew and Mark say when the other apostles heard it, they were indignant. And that's when Jesus has this explanation and teaching lesson. In Luke, the mother is nowhere mentioned. In Luke, this whole thing unfolds at the Lord's Supper. Stark differences. Now, what are we going to say? Luke's an idiot and can't keep his story straight. He's got these other gospels in front of him. He's got all of this stuff, but for some reason he starts freelancing and making stuff up. Heavens no! The guy's brilliant. And a brilliant person is going to do brilliantly. I'd love to tell you the answer to this, but i got to do it in a minute, so we'll keep going. Not only are the words the same, are different, the details are different. This discussion over who's the greatest among the disciples is a good example. The order's different, the temptations. In Matthew, it's first stones into bread. Then it's uh, uh, the temple, cast yourself down. Then it's the mountain. Bow before me, you get all the kingdoms. In Luke, it's the bread, then the mountain, then the temple. So the order's different. And it's not just there. There are some other differences as well. So what do we do with all of these things? Well, even the content, to some degree, has some differences. Look at the empty tomb. How many angels and where are they? Now, I hope this has picked your interest. Because these are phenomenal things. This gives us a fuller picture than we would ever have otherwise. This gives us angles and glimpses that show us the richness of God in Scripture. This shows the majesty of what God has done in Scripture like nothing else ever could. And we now have 12 minutes for me to tell you about it. 13. So let's get going. Let me give you a trial lawyer solution. And I, I, I really think this is reasonable. Here's my solution. As a general rule, you give your deference to the earliest witnesses. Whatever's earliest. 
What do we have here that's really early worth looking at? We have three things. We have the titles on each gospel, which are so early. Gospel according to Matthew, gospel according to Mark, gospel according to Luke. They're so early the church can't figure out who put them on there. So we've got titles. Not only that, we've got Luke at the beginning of his gospel saying that other people have put together accounts. That these are accounts by witnesses from the beginning. And then the third thing we've got is Papias who wrote into the first century, early second century. He's quoted by Eusebius who is a reliable quoter. And Eusebius quotes Papias as saying that Matthew composed his Gospels or organized and structured his Gospels in Hebrew or Aramaic, probably the same word for either at that point in time in the Greek language. And others translated them into Greek as they were able. Now, at the risk of just sounding idiot simple, may I suggest to you how our Gospels came to be and why we have this synoptic phenomenon? Jesus called some fishermen and said, come, I'll make you fishers of men, and was able to take their vocations and turn their vocations into something that serves the kingdom. But he also grabbed a tax collector named Matthew. And he didn't say, come, and I'll make you a tax collector for men. You can pass the basket at church. But do you know what that tax collector did? Matthew, the Levite, the tax collector, was stationed in Capernaum and how we'll show you Capernaum and where it is on the Sea of Galilee on the trade routes from the the Greek cities that go to the Mediterranean and and as goods and services passed by Matthew's there to collect make a record for the Roman governor and give a receipt he's got the little pads and the notes and that's what he does for a living He's got to keep records and accounts. Now these are not pristine parchments that are going to last for a long time. You're not keeping those little scraps on leathered hide. It's on little papyrus sheets. Good enough to get you by and last for records. And that's who Jesus calls. And Jesus has Matthew there. And Matthew is, as Papias said, writing the Gospels in Hebrew. He's the note taker. Now what happens? You've got the note taker who's taking contemporaneous notes. I don't know if he did it on Sunday. Probably did not do it on Sabbath. But who knows? But he's weekly or regularly writing down what happened. Those notes become vibrant. They become important. Paul's telling Timothy at the end of Paul's life, Hey, bring me my notes and my parchments and my books. The word for books? Notes. Papyrus. They didn't have, it's not books like we have. It's, bring me my notes. If you look at Matthew, I mean, if you look at Paul writing to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, he quotes Jesus in the exact same words that Luke does. Because Paul and Luke together are doing mission work. Who else does mission work with them? Mark. We know Matthew's a missionary. We know Peter's a missionary. Matthew's got these notes. Don't you know that Paul, when he goes to Jerusalem before he starts his mission trip, says, I want to know all about Jesus. Show me your notes. Paul's a scholar. Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He knows the importance of notes and scrolls. And he takes those notes and he's got those notes and he's able to teach the gospel everywhere he goes because he's got Matthew's notes. Peter's got them. Peter may not be able to read, but Mark's got him, and Mark's the one who writes Peter's gospel. The common source is not some unknown Q document. The common source are the notes of Matthew. And it explains why Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have some great similarities. But Matthew wrote his notes in Hebrew. So they're translated by different people as they're able, according to Papias. And so different people translate them. And so sometimes the words will be the same. They've got the same translator. Sometimes they'll be different. Those differences in words are nuances. Sometimes part of the story is told for emphasis by one person, but a different part of the story by someone else. You bet Matthew reordered the temptations. Why? Because in Matthew, one of the common themes is Jesus on the mountain. Moses was on Mount Sinai, Jesus is on the mountain. He gives a sermon on the mount. 
He goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is on the mountain when he gives the Great Commission. He goes on the mountain to teach in each of his discourses in Matthew. Jesus is the mountain experience is the pinnacle. So when Matthew puts the temptations out there, he puts the pinnacle temptation at the end, Jesus on the mountain for the last temptation. See, there's beauty in what's going on in this synoptic flow. The problem is a lot of academic scholars that you may read don't ever want to believe Matthew, Mark, or Luke could have been written as early as I believe they were written. They won't say Matthew wrote Matthew because Matthew's got predictions about the temple falling. And that happened in 70 A.D. So the skeptic scholar who doesn't believe God works says Matthew's got to have been written after 70 A.D. And as a result, they can't say that these are contemporaneous notes. But if you look at uh, all of this, uh, I don't have time, i got to keep going, ah, da, 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 da. you look at all of those issues. And they're all dealt with if you just accept what history and common sense says. The scholar who's got to construct this bizarre ivory tower of Q, oh, it gets worse. They have now have to develop it to where there's multiple Qs, and it's not only now Mark that's being copied, but since it's not copied right, there was a proto-Mark that's now disappeared, and then the Mark we have is a later supplementation. It gets so elaborate, there's such a ruse being done. By the early church, and, and, and the early church is totally deceived by it, according to these scholars. And it's just ridiculous. But look, why do the three Gospels have similar material? Because Matthew took the notes. And Matthew had access to his own notes when he wrote his Gospel. Mark had a set of the notes. Luke had a set of the notes. They may have been translated differently, but they've got the same notes. Why do they have similarities? Because they've got the same notes. Not only that, Mark writes Peter's gospel. And Peter's gospel is set out in the exact same order. The gospel of Mark is set out in the exact same order as Peter preaches to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Starts with John the Baptist, ends with Jesus appearing to witnesses. It is Peter's gospel written out. Matthew and Luke, they add the nativity stories and the birth of Jesus. That's not the way Peter preached his gospel. Peter doesn't start there. And it all makes perfect sense. Order and access to the Gospels. Heavens, they were all together. Mark writes the Gospel of Peter from Rome according to the early church. Well, Paul's the one who wrote to Timothy and said, Get Mark up here to Rome. Have him bring my notes. Luke is with me right now. Luke goes back to Jerusalem where he sees Matthew and the other apostles. All of this works perfectly well and sensibly as long as you're willing to let the Gospels be early witnesses. But the, the, the cynical scholars can't do that. Problems with Matthew and Luke using Mark? No, they had the same notes. The stark differences? You bet, because they're writing to different audiences. You get three preachers. Tell three preachers you preach a gospel sermon. They're all going to preach the gospel sermon if they're well-grounded preachers, but you're going to hear different stories from each one. That's just the way of it. Matthew's writing to a Jewish mentality. And so he's going to put things in there that appeal to a Jewish mentality. Mark's writing to a Roman mentality. He's going to put a different set of things in there. Luke's writing to Theophilus, this Greek fellow, whoever he may be. And Luke wants to do an orderly account so that Theophilus and others can be certain of what they've been taught. And so that's what Luke's about doing. It all makes perfect sense. So points for home. And I'll let Steve do his drawing. Before I get to the points for home, I just want to say one thing. I appreciate scholars. I really do. These people dig real hard. They work real hard. They got to publish or perish. So they're always trying to come up with something new to write. And I respect them for being able to do that. But sometimes I'm afraid they've... When you dump the idea that there could be a divine God who could give prophecy, that miracles really could happen, when you dump that idea, then you can't have an early date for the Gospels. Because there's just no way it can be written when there are still eyewitnesses who would totally dispel everything that's said there. 
And so if you say there were no miracles and there was no resurrection and there was no prophecy, if that's your starting point, you've got to date those Gospels late. Or no one would have accepted them. And once you date them late, you're in a real horrible predicament on trying to figure out why they're so related to each other. You're having to make up all of this Q stuff and all of this, and, and, and this idea that these guys were incredible scholars who did this incredible work, yet were incredibly sloppy and made all these incredible stupid mistakes. And so you start trying to, and, and you just build this house of cards that, that in a courtroom would just crumble. And the only way to avoid it is to recognize that these Gospels were written by who they claim to have been written by as eyewitnesses with contemporary accounts from the beginning of Jesus' ministry as Luke said he had at his disposal and they were written early enough to where the witnesses were still around to confirm or deny the truth of what was in there which is why the early church accepted them and why hundreds and thousands of people would give their lives believing this. And Tertullian, the lawyer, was able to say the church, the early church was built on the blood of the witnesses. That's why. Here are your points for home. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Matthew says that. Paul says the same thing. Have the same attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus. Who although he existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God the thing to be grasped. But, Paul says, became a servant. Same thing Paul saw. As it was with Jesus, so may it be with us. May we want, seek the greatness is in the serving. This is what Pastor Fleming had as one of his points for dealing with stress of Christmas. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the rest of the Paul reference. Paul takes the quote of Jesus and puts it into theology in Philippians when he says that being made in the form of a bondservant, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul takes Jesus' statements and puts it into theology, all to drive home the point, as it was with Jesus, may it be with us. May we seek to serve. But now we can jump over to Luke's version of this, where Luke adds more. And I assure you, Jesus didn't speak in 15-second sound bites. I'll bet he spoke on this for 20 or 30 minutes. If he was Fleming, he'd have spoken for an hour and a half. If he's me, I'm out of time. I better quit preaching. All I'm saying is, is yeah, there was a lot more material to supplement with. Luke's got no trouble saying, hey, listen to this. Theophilus and others... Let me put this into language you understand. Jesus was saying, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. Let the leader become as one who serves. Don't think just because you lead the church, you're not in service. That's who leads in service. And Luke felt it important to explain it in those terms. That's not because he's an idiot. That's because he's inspired. There is no greater calling than to serve in Jesus' name. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for the depths and riches, not only of who you are, who Jesus is, the love that you have for us, so deep, so wide, but the way you've expressed this to us in such a treasure. And I pray that we'll be diligent students looking to learn you through your revelation. We pray in Jesus' amen.